Hello, good day everyone. Here I am, Miss Merle, to talk about nucleic acid extraction methods. Uh, nucleic acid extraction is a fundamental step in molecular biology and genetics research. Um, it is essential for obtaining high quality DNA or RNA from biological samples. And this process, nucleic acid extraction, is crucial for various applications, including PCR, DNA sequencing, gene expression analysis, and genotyping. So the choice of extraction method depends on the type of sample, the intended downstream application, and the desired nucleic acid, DNA, or RNA. So uh, here is our topic outline. So we have DNA isolation. We will also be talking about RNA isolation. And to uh, we need to measure the nucleic acid uh, based on its quality and quantity. So we have qualitative and quantitative approaches. So we have electrophoresis, spectral photometry, and fluorometry. So our objectives include the following. Uh, we need to compare and contrast inorganic, organic, and solid phase approaches for isolating cellular and mitochondrial DNA. We need to note the chemical conditions or what are those conditions in which uh, DNA tends to go out into solution and form large aggregates. We also need to compare and contrast organic and solid phase approaches for isolating total RNA. And um, as a student, we need to distinguish between the isolation of total RNA with that of messenger RNA. And also, we need to describe the gel-based, spectrophotometric, and fluorometric methods used to determine the quantity and quality of DNA and RNA preparations. And lastly, we need to know how to do the calculations of DNA and RNA, RNA yields from a given nucleic acid preparation. So uh, the goal of extraction or the purpose of extraction is to liberate, it is to release nucleic acids from cells, uh, making it or making the nucleic acids available for use in subsequent processes. Ideally, the objective is to ensure that the desired nucleic acid is free or devoid from contamination, any form of contamination. So examples of the contaminants, we've got proteins, carbohydrates, lipids, and other nucleic acids, especially uh, we have DNA free of RNA or RNA free of DNA. The uh, initial step for uh, nucleic acid extraction, it involves uh, liberating or releasing or breaking the cellular material by disrupting both the cell and nuclear membranes through a process known as cell light process, uh, known as cell lysis. This one. It is crucial to conduct lysis under conditions that are safe enough to maintain the integrity of the nucleic acid, meaning uh, it must uh, the cell lysis must take place in conditions that will not damage the nucleic acids. And then subsequent to lysis, the desired Material undergoes purification, of course, after which the sample's concentration and purity can be assessed. So again, the first step of extraction is cell lysis. And cell lysis, we should uh, be very careful that um, it is happening in conditions that will not damage our target nucleic acids. So when uh, discussing nucleic acid extraction, two primary types come to mind. We have RNA and DNA. For DNA extraction, uh, we focus on cellular DNA and mitochondrial DNA. Uh, mitochondrial DNA or mtDNA stands out as a distinct genetic material housed in the mitochondria. The energy uh, generating organel organelles within or eukaryotic cells so unlike nuclear DNA residing in the cell uh, nucleus, mtDNA or mitochondrial DNA is circular and resides in the mitochondria, playing a vital role in cellular energy production. And conversely, we have RNA extraction involves a 
determining total RNA or extracting mRNA. So we have total and messenger. In DNA extraction process, inorganic phases uh, involves or uses salts. Conversely, RNA extraction involves the use of guanidine isothiocyanate. And both DNA or RNA extraction processes share similarities in organic phases, employing essential reagents like phenol and chloroform. So in short, if we are having inorganic extraction for our DNA, we can use salts for organic. Both uh, DNA or RNA utilize uh, phenol and chloroform. In these uh, methods, the separation of nucleic acids from contaminants is crucial. And we have, <coughs> sorry, solid phase techniques play a significant role in both uh, DNA and RNA extraction. So magnetic beads are employed or more commonly uh, spin columns are utilized. And these provide efficient and reliable separation methods. And these advancements contribute to the precision and versatility of nucleic acid, acid extraction techniques. So uh, it was a Friedrich Mischer. So it's up to you how to read his name. Uh, he was a Swiss biochemist and was credited with the discovery of DNA. The he was the first to isolate DNA from human cells in the late 19th century. It was in 1860s when, he, when ah, sorry, he conducted pioneering work on the chemical composition of WBCs, isolating a novel substance he called nucleine. And then this substance was later identified as DNA. So it was his work that laid the foundation for our understanding of DNA. And although the true significance of DNA as the genetic material was not fully appreciated until decades later, his process involved the following general steps, sample collection, cell lysis, nuclein extraction, that's the DNA, and precipitation. On the right-hand side, we have Matthew Messelson and Franklin William Stahl. Uh, they conducted groundbreaking experiments in 1958 uh, that provided compelling evidence for the semi-conservative replication of DNA. And the uh, DNA samples were subjected to density gradient centrifugation. And this is a technique that um, separates molecules based on their buoyant densities. In this case, uh, the density gradient was created using cesium chloride. So we have what is density gradient also ultra sorry ultra centrifugation. So this uh it's a commonly employed method to extract and refine cellular structures for biochemical studies, which involves the usage of high speed centrifuge, or also known as the ultra centrifuge. And that ultra centrifuge facilitates the gentle separation of cellular components within the density gradient without causing damage. So, sorry. In a suspension comprising particles suspended in a liquid solvent, the force of gravity leads to the sedimentation of particles. So, dense uh, particles denser than the solvent and the buoyancy of those less dense than the solvent. So, when multiple liquids with different densities are present in the tube, Centrifugation results in their stratification into distinct layers according to density with the most dense liquid settling closest to the base. So here in our case, we have erythrocytes and PMNs. So before uh, centrifugation, we only have two layers. But after centrifugation using density gradient ultra centrifugation, we have four layers already. So uh, the question is, uh, what are the conditions when DNA goes out into the solution? So this is one of the objectives. So large, uh, when the chromosomal DNA with a size exceeding 50 uh, kilobase pairs and associated proteins, exhibit, they exhibit improper denaturation when neutralized in acetate 
or low pH following alkaline treatment. Instead of properly uh, renaturing, these large molecules, uh, they tend to... I'm not really feeling well. Form sizable aggregates, so they form large aggregates and they tend to precipitate out from the solution. In contrast, the smaller plasmids revert to their super cold, they revert, they return to their super cold state and then remain in the solution. So it is only when the chromosomal DNA exceeds 50 kilobase pairs wherein we can observe the formation of large aggregates. So alkaline lysis was uh, in the past was extensively used to extract one to fifty kilobase pairs plasmid DNA from bacteria. So this is an FYI. And then what are plasmids? So plasmids are small circular uh, molecules that are separate from the chromosomal DNA in the cells of bacteria and some other organisms. And unlike the chromosomal DNA, which contains essential genetic information for basic functioning and the survival of organisms, plasmids carry additional genetic material that is not strictly necessary for the whole survival. So, but some books would say that often they carry additional genetic material like uh, genes for antibiotic resistance. And uh, plasmids are particularly notable for their role in molecular biology and biotech. So, they are often used by research, researchers as vectors. Vectors to introduce, replicate, and express foreign genes in host cells. In nature, plasmids carry genes that provide advantages to the host cell, such as, uh, again, antibiotic resistance or their ability to metabolize certain substances. So this can contribute to the survival and adaptation of bacteria in their environments. Plasmids can also be transferred uh, between bacterial cells through processes like conjugation, enabling the spread of useful genetic traits. So sample preparation or uh, the time that we will be preparing the biological samples for nucleic acid analysis encompass a diverse array of materials obtained from living organisms. And these samples serve as crucial starting points for studying DNA and RNA. So offering insights into uh, genetics, uh, gene expression, and various molecular processes. So the choice of sample type depends on the research goals and the specific nucleic acid of interest. So here are some common biological samples used in NA or nucleic acid analysis. So we have blood. We can use whole blood, serum, or plasma, and applications include uh, blood samples, which are uh, they are rich in nucleic acids and often used for genetic testing, disease diagnosis, and forensic analysis. And then we also have uh, tissue samples, biopsy samples, frozen tissues, formalin fixed paraffin embedded tissues, or FFPE, and uh, applications include tissue samples are crucial for the understanding of gene expression, identifying mutations, and studying diseases such as cancers. So we, we also have cells. So cells like primary cells, stem cells, or cultured cells. We can also use uh, whole blood or no, whole saliva or buccal swabs. We have hair strands or black hair follicles, whole urine or sediment, and fluid surrounding the brain, that's CSF, stool samples, and soil, water, or air, because they contain microorganisms, microbial DNA, aiding in ecological and environmental studies. And for can also have plants, the leaves, the seeds, the roots, and so much more. So almost um, everything we can do nucleic acid analysis. So uh, if we are processing nucleated cells in suspension, there is a need for us to do sample pretreatment. And this is so that uh, to make nucleated cells will be available for extraction. And then when isolating WBCs from clinical samples, we get two methods of isolation. We have DDGC or differential density gradient centrifugation, 
and the other one is differential lysis. For DDGC, the following steps are employed. So whole blood or bone marrow with NSS is prepared, overlaid, overlaid with a fecal, and then centrifugation will follow. And then there is separation of the components and the mononuclear WBCs from the fecal gradient will be collected. So let's just like this one. Here, this is the area of interest, the layer of interest, the fecal bank. And we also have differential lysis. So here, uh, we make use of the uh, char character of RBCs because they are highly uh, fragile. They have this osmotic fragility. And then whole blood or bone marrow incubation in it, uh, whole blood or bone marrow incubation follows in hypotonic buffer or water. And then RBCs will be lysed prior to WBCs. And then the WBCs will be pelleted through centrifugation. So what is fecal? Uh, fecal is a highly branched sucrose uh, polymer that does not uh, it does not how to say uh, does not penetrate biological samples upon centrifugation the mononuclear wbc's the mononuclear wbc's okay the desired cells for isolation of nucleic acids settle into a layer in the fecal gradient that is below the less dense plasma components and above the polymorphonuclear cells and the RBCs. So the layer containing the mononuclear cells is removed from the tube and washed by at least two rounds of resuspension and centrifugation in saline, proceeding with the nucleic acid isolation procedure. So if uh, you are thinking about fecal, then it's used to that's the layer in which we can get our sample. And then for uh, tissue samples, fresh or frozen tissue samples can be this must be uh, first dissociated before we can begin with our DNA isolation procedures. So methods of tissue dissociation include the following. We can use liquid nitrogen to grind the frozen tissues. We can also homogenize the tissues with a homogenizer. Or uh, if we don't have the first two, then simply we can do mincing. We can mince the tissue using a scalpel. So this one is an example of a tissue homogenizer. We can also uh, do for the fixed embedded tissues. What's wrong with my eyes? So, sorry. Uh, we can deparaffinize it by soaking in silane. But since silane is toxic, so we need to use the lesser or less toxic substitutes for silane, and we have the following: is to solve and attack propar and paraclear. And after the the paraffinization, we need to uh, rehydrate the sample by soaking it in decreasing concentrations of ethanol. So for uh, microorganisms, well, uh, certain bacteria and fungi. Uh, possess robust cell walls. And these uh, robust cell walls need to be disrupted from the liberation of, for the liberation of the nucleic acid. So various enzyme products such as uh, lysozyme and zymolase are commercially available and can digest cell wall polymers effectively. So alternatively, uh, mechanical methods like grinding or vigorous mixing with glass beads can be employed to break cell walls. But uh, more gentle enzymatic approaches are preferable as they are less likely to cause damage to the chromosomal DNA, making them suitable for methods targeting larger chromosomal entities rather than plasmidine. And another method involves treating bacterial cell walls with detergents. So we have 1% sodium dodecyl sulfate and a strong base of 0.2 molar sodium hydroxide. 
or we can also do boiling. Boiling procedures uh, can uh, result to the denaturation and may not be a uh, denaturation. So meaning uh, the DNA tends to become single-stranded. So um, it may not be suitable for methods such as restriction enzyme analysis that require double-stranded DNA. So if you uh, wanted to have or isolate or extract DSDNA, do not boil. So you can, we can just use enzymatic methods. So uh, this table shows the yield of DNA from different tissue specimen sources. So as what we can free, see from here, uh, for specimens without DNA amplification, an ML of bone marrow has the highest yield of DNA as compared to blood and buffy coat using the same volume of sample. While uh, on the specimens with amplified DNA, it is quite interesting that we can still recover 1 mg recovered DNA out from 1 mg of feces, like 2 to 10 picograms. And bones, teeth, hair follicles are samples common in crime scene investigation. So we can still, uh, we can still uh, get DNA from dried blood, from bone, from teeth, from hair follicles, from recall cells. So uh, our next activity in the laboratory will be a uh, looking for DNA from our cheek cells, buccal cells. So organic isolation methods. So after the release of DNA from the cell, there must be further purification. So uh, that purification process means the removal of contaminating agents like proteins, lipids, carbs, and cell debris. So how can we purify? By using high salt, a low pH, an organic mixture of phenol and chloroform. So phenol and chloroform, this is these are really the reagents used for organic isolation. And you might, uh, this combination of high heat, low, low, sorry, low pH and an organic mixture of phenol and chloroform can readily dissolve hydrophobic contaminants, collect cell de debris, and strip away most DNA-associated proteins. On the right-hand side, we can observe here the general scheme of organic DNA isolation. So we have cells in suspension, and then these cells will be lysed using SDS, sodium dodecyl sulfate, and sodium hydroxide. And once lysed, the lysed cells will, will undergo acidification with acetic acid and salts. So it will lead to the formation of cell debris. And that uh, cell debris, we, and we have the uh, two layers, because uh, the cell debris and the acid, uh, this, I'm sorry, the acidified light cells will have two uh, layers. Once uh, we will do the organic isolation method, but or we will e extract DNA by using phenol and chloroform. So you might wonder where can we find the DNA? The DNA is on the upper part, on the upper part, the aqueous solution. And then this aqueous solution, uh, we need to precipitate. The, we will remove that, place it in a different Eppendorf tube, and then we will add. Then we will add ethanol, and uh, there, there is DNA precipitation, and that's our DNA sample ready. So, uh, as a continuation of the organic isolation methods, so let's start with uh, hydrophilic cleared cell lysates. And we will add chloroform and phenol. And that addition of phenol and chloroform will result to the formation of a biphasic emulsion. And that biphasic emulsion will undergo centrifugation. After centrifugation, there will be three layers. The top layer is the hydrophilic layer, wherein it is the site where DNA dissolves. It is the site that we need to collect that aqueous phase is the most important layer because it is where we can find the DNA. We also have the white layer that uh, interface between the top and the bottom layer. So that's the uh, the amphiphilic component part plus the cell debris. And the bottom part, we have the hydrophobic layer, the lipids. So the upper phase with DNA is collected. This is the real sample. 
and then precipitated using ethanol or isopropanol or in a high concentration of spirits. And note, the ethyl or isopropyl alcohol is added to the upper phase solution at 2 is to 1 if ethyl and 1 is to 1 if isopropyl alcohol. And then after that, DNA forms a solid precipitate. So uh, we're done with the organic isolation methods. Now let's shift the talk about inorganic isolation techniques. So inorganic isolation methods, these methods are known as salting out methods or techniques. These are done to selectively precipitate proteins leaving the DNA in solution. And then it uses conditions with low salt, I uh, no, no, sorry, low pH and high salt, hence the term or phrase salting out, high salt. And DNA precipitation is by using isopropanol pelleted and resuspended in TRIS EDTA buffer or water. TRIS EDTA, that's TE buffer. So here we have the, this is the inorganic uh, isolation, isolation method general scheme. So salts and suspension will be lysed using TE and SDS. And then the lysed cells will undergo uh, precipitation for the protein by using a sodium acetate. And then we have two layers. We have the cell debris and then this aqueous solution will be removed and transferred to another Eppendorf and then we will precipitate the DNA by using isopropanol. So the solid phase isolation method, so we're the organic, inorganic, now we are on the solid phase isolation method. Solid phase in a sense that we're using matrices or we're, uh, yeah so the older uh, methods under solid phase isolation techniques use silica based products and uh, silicates uh, effectively bind dna in high salt concentration so always remember high salt in organic isolation methods high salt so there's also a variation of silica based products by using diatomaceous earth but uh, the first uh, column is, a, is the, a thing of the past. Now we're using column or bead matrices. So these are modern solid matrix systems. This one, this is the column. So columns come in various sizes. So it depends on the amount of DNA to be isolated. And specifically, uh, the term is, or the phrase for this is spin columns that fit inside micro, micro sorry, centrifuge tubes. And this is to isolate viral and bacterial DNA from serum, CSF, or plasma, and for the routine isolation of cellular DNA in cancer studies or oncology and genetics. But guys, remember that sample prep is similar to organic and inorganic methods, and it starts with cell lysis to release the DNA. So, uh, the solid phase isolation method. So here, uh, the cell lysate is introduced into a column in a containing a high salt buffer, and then the DNA present in the solution binds to the solid matrix, and then the anchored DNA is then subjected to a buffer wash, the anchored or adsorbed, and subsequently, uh, the DNA is released from the column using a specific volume of water, uh, trees EDTA, and other low salt buffer. And then both the uh, the washing solutions and the eluted DNA can be moved through the column by using a uh, gravity vacuum or centrifugal force. So for DNA attached to magnetic beads, a magnet is employed externally to the tube to attract and collect the beads. And simultaneously, the buffer is either aspirated or poured off during the process. And then DNA elution. So what is elution? So this one is a process of releasing or removing or extracting DNA from a substrate or matrix in which it has been bound or captured. So this step is commonly employed in various uh, lab techniques such as DNA purification, and chromatography, but in our case, uh, this is for DNA purification. D DNA elution is for is a process intended for DNA purification. So, uh, during DNA elution, uh, specific conditions such as the use of low salt buffer, water, 
or a specialized elution buffer are applied to break the interactions between the DNA molecules and the substrate, allowing uh, the DNA to be recovered in a purified form for further analysis or applications. And then um, we also have automation for the solid phase isolation methods. So uh, things are getting easier in the lab. So here now, now we have DNA IQ system by Promega. This one uh, utilizes a magnetic resin that can uh, hold uh, 100 nanograms of DNA. And then when the DNA is eluted in 100 UL, then it is expected that the DNA concentration is known, which is one nanograms per UL. And this one is ready for analysis. We also have a Roche, MagnaPure, and Kaigen biorobot. So both employ solid phase isolation of DNA from the following sources, like uh, blood, tissue, bone marrow, plasma, and other body fluids. And both uh, automated systems uh, utilize magnetized glass beads or membranes to bind DNA. So here, uh, 200 to 400 UL of whole blood or 10 to 50 mg of tissue in sample tubes is placed in the instrument along with the cartridges. Our racks of tubes containing their agents used for isolation. And so the instrument is then programmed to lyse the cells and isolate and elute the DNA automatically. So here uh, we have crude lysis. So you might wonder, oh, we have the automated, but we can also perform the crude lysis procedures. So crude lysis uh, is employed or in conditions where in simple lysis of cellular material in the sample will yield sufficiently useful amounts of DNA for the amplific amplification process. Why? Why crude lysis? Because uh, these uh, circumstances preclude or prohibit uh, extensive DNA purification. So screening large numbers of samples by simple methods, isolation of DNA from limited amounts of starting material, and if you're having challenging samples such as fixed or paraffin embedded tissues like this one. So uh, the following uh, circumstances will just require crude lysis of cells. We also have the uh, proteolytic lysis of fixed material. So examination of uh, paraffin samples. So typically thin sections are employed for the uh, analysis of paraffin samples. Although very small samples like needle biopsies uh, sectioning is uh, maybe unnecessary. And then for paraffin embedded specimens, the initial steps involve dewaxing using silane and uh, the subsequent rehydration before the isolation of nucleic acids. And then in the context of somatic mutation analysis, we have a distinct stained. Sorry. Serial suction can uh, is essential, and this suction is then microscopically examined to identify tumor cells. And then we have uh, chelating resins used for extraction. So what is Kelex? Is it is a cation chelating resin that can be used for simple DNA extraction. So these are the steps and. Uh, this method is most commonly used for forensic applications. So if you can see the word calyx or chelating resins for DNA or RNA extractions, then those are for forensic applications. And here we are on the isolation of mitochondrial DNA, those circular DNA that reside in the mitochondria. So there are two methods of isolating or extracting mitochondrial DNA from eukaryotic cells. So in the first approach, uh, mitochondria are initially isolated through centrifugation and after homo homo uh, sorry, homogenizing uh, cell preparations by grinding on ice. Sorry. Uh, the homogenate undergoes low-speed centrifugation at 700 to 26,000 xg or grav x gravity to form a pellet containing intact cells. 
nuclei and cellular debris. So a second high-speed certification, 10,000 to 16,000 XG is then performed to pellet the mitochondria from the supernatant. And then subsequently, the mitochondria are lysed with detergent and the resulting lysate is treated with proteinase to eliminate protein impurities. So, uh, so the mitochondrial DNA can be precipitated using cold ethanol and then reconstituted in water or suitable buffers for subsequent lysis. And in the second approach, isolating a uh, total of DNA, yeah, in the second approach to mitochondrial DNA, uh, preparation total DNA is isolated following the previously prescribed steps. And this preparation contains mitochondrial DNA, which can be analyzed within the overall DNA background using techniques such as hybridization or PCR. So uh, RNA isolation. So um, handling RNA in the laboratory necessitates stringent measures to prevent the degradation of sample RNA. And RNA is particularly uh, susceptible to degradation due to the widespread presence of RNases. And uh, these enzymes, which are small, are, what are RNases? Oh, they are enzymes. They are small proteins. They have the ability to renature and regain activity even after autoclaving. And in contrast to DNases, an RNases must be eradicated or deactivated before RNA isolation as they can maintain their activity across a broad temperature range, like this one below negative 20 degrees Celsius, and can still reform their active state even after exposure to heat. So that's the caveat, that's the warning for RNA, the presence of RNAs in the environment. And then what are the ways to minimize RNA degradation? So it is essential to establish a dedicated RNAs, a free RNF zone within the laboratory for the storage of materials and handling of specimens. It is imperative to wear gloves at all times when, when inside the RNF area and disposable such as tubes and tips that come in contact with RNA must be stored exclusively in this designated location and should never be handled without gloves. Items labeled as DNAs free or RNF by suppliers can be utilized directly from their packaging. Glasswares or glassware 